Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. From the Legislative Building here in Regina, we have Premier Scott Moe and Dr. Volker Gertz of Vito Intervac. Joining us on the line is our Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Saqib Shahab. Premier Moe and Dr. Gertz will have remarks regarding today's announcement, and Dr. Shahab will provide a brief COVID-19 update before we move on to questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining us here this afternoon, and welcome to Dr. Volker Gertz and, of course, uh, to Dr. Shahab. Uh, Saskatchewan continues to lead the nation when it comes to delivering our COVID-19 vaccines. We've now administered about 105% of the doses that we have received, which is by far the highest percentage of any province in the nation. Our healthcare workers have now provided more than 62,000 shots to Saskatchewan people. That equates to about 5,300 shots per 100,000 population, which is the second highest in the nation, behind only the smallest province in the nation, which is Prince Edward Island. 81% of our long-term care residents have now received their first shot, and 46% of our long-term care residents have received their second shot. This is so very important. As we all know, this has been one of the most vulnerable groups of people for serious outcomes from the COVID-19 virus. And we look forward to, in the very near future, to have all of our seniors in long-term care being fully vaccinated and being fully vaccinated as soon as possible. I do want to thank all of our healthcare workers involved in delivering the vaccines so quickly, safely, and efficiently in all corners of the province. It's greatly appreciated. We now have settled into what is a somewhat predictable, but also somewhat frustrating pattern. Each week, we receive a new shipment of a few thousand doses from our federal government. Our healthcare workers uh, virtually get all of those doses into people's arms in three to four days each week. And then we wait for our next shipment to arrive. As you can imagine, we could much have this happen much more quickly um, if we were receiving enough vaccines to be delivering shots in more locations, possibly all of our locations across the province, and doing so in a more consistent basis. Despite Saskatchewan's strong record relative to the rest of Canada, Canada is trailing many other countries because we simply are not receiving vaccines quickly enough. This is a, pros a prosperous, industrialized nation, a G7 country with one of the best healthcare systems in the world, so it's almost in inexplicable that Canada has fallen so far behind on the vaccines. I'm not here today to point fingers or to second guess why that may have occurred, but I do want to ensure that it never happens again. Given the scarce supply of vaccines in our nation, it's understandable, in, in, in the world, quite frankly, it's understandable that a type of vaccine nationalism has emerged, with vaccine-producing nations taking steps to ensure that their citizens have access to those vaccines first. Well, Canada should be one of those vaccine-producing nations. And Canada should be a world leader in not only research, but also the development and production of new vaccines. And that place should happen right here, and that, that should happen right here in Saskatchewan. More specifically, that can happen right at Vito, our Vito Intervac facility in Saskatoon. So to put, today I am very pleased to announce that our government is committing $15 million to support Vito's new proposed Centre for Pandemic Research. Along with Vito, we are requesting $45 million in federal government support and ongoing operational funding for this project. This will not only serve Saskatchewan residents, but it will serve all Canadians through research, development, and ultimately the production of new vaccines. This would be a level four containment facility, and I'll let Dr. Gertz explain exactly what that means in a few moments. What I do know is that this would greatly enhance Vito's vaccine research and development capabilities, again, a benefit to all Canadians. Right now, there is only one level four facility in the nation, and that is the National Microbiology Lab, or the NML, in Winnipeg. The NML has indicated its support for this proposal and would work closely with Vito. Minister Harrison and I have written to and had conversations with senior federal ministers about this proposal as recently as uh, last evening, and we are hopeful and uh, we are quite confident that we will be able to obtain the necessary federal support for this project to go ahead. As you know, Vito is already in the process of expanding its vaccine manufacturing capability. Construction began last October, and 
Uh, construction would be completed by this October. Production of vaccines could uh, then uh, begin sometime in 2022 with the capability to produce um, up to 40 million vaccines a year. To be clear, this is unlikely to have a, much of an impact on our current vac COVID vaccination drive. We expect Saskatchewan residents to be fully vaccinated before the end of, of 2021. However, we should be ready to produce millions of vaccines, doses of vaccines to respond to any new viruses that may present or variants of the COVID virus that may present in the future um, and respond as required. Saskatchewan is the leader in Canada in delivering vaccines. We can, we should, and we will be the leader in researching, developing, and producing these vaccines. Producing them not just for Saskatchewan residents, but again, producing them for all Canadians. We're asking the federal government and the Prime Minister to support this proposal to ensure that Canada always has the ability to develop and produce our own life-saving vaccines and to ensure that the vaccine shortage that we are experiencing now at the most critical moment in our lifetimes never happens again. Before I turn it over to Dr. Gertz, I would just note that there are a few more cases of COVID variants that have now been, that have now been detected in Saskatchewan. And I know Dr. Shahab will have a bit more to say about these cases following Dr. Gertz's comments. I'll say that it is a reminder for all of us as to why we need to keep doing exactly what we are doing, following all of the public health orders and the guidelines and to ensure that we are keeping ourselves and, and keeping others safe until such time that we have access to a vaccine. So I'd now like to ask Dr. Gertz to say a few words about the work that's being done at Vito Intervac today and the work that they will be doing uh, in the future uh, should this, uh, should this uh, uh, proposal uh, move forward. And as I said, I'm confident that we will have the federal government's support in doing so in the, in the, uh, in, in the days ahead. Dr. Gertz. So thank you, Premier Mo. Um, good afternoon. I wanted to start out um, thanking the government of Saskatchewan for today's commitment and announcement. This is, of course, fantastic news for our organization. It will allow Oviedo to establish um, a Canadian Centre for Pandemic Research right here at the University of Saskatchewan, which will be to the benefit of all Canadians and, of course, to the benefits of the residents of Saskatchewan and our livestock. This facility will focus both on human diseases as well as animal diseases and thus have a huge impact on our lives and that of our animals. It will help us to prepare and be better prepared for future emerging diseases, um, both affecting humans and animals. And it will build on existing infrastructure that we already have at the University of Saskatchewan. We already operate Canada's largest high containment laboratory. And with the investment of the province of Saskatchewan and also the federal government, we're currently constructing a GMP vaccine manufacturing facility, as the Premier just mentioned. So together, those two key elements are critical in rapidly responding to a new emerging disease. And so we already have those two in place. What today's announcement and then hopefully the commitment from the federal government will allow us to do is now build on that existing infrastructure, leverage those previous investment, upgrade our containment space to the highest level and also allow us to build a new animal facility to be able to work with those animals from which these new diseases emerge. And that includes bats, reptiles, insects, all these exotic species from which we see these, these um, pathogens jump into humans essentially. And Vito has a bit of a track record. As you know, we were the first in Canada to isolate the virus. We were the first in Canada to have an animal model established that allows us to test vaccines and antivirals and drugs and so on. And we are now also the first university lab to actually have a vaccine in clinical trials. Our, our trials are ongoing right now. We're in phase one, phase two trials, and we're looking forward to taking our vaccine into development as soon as that is possible. So today's f f announcement is really an, an, a great, um, great honor for us and, and, and really amazing for the organization. And we're looking forward to the federal government to um, come up with the, with the $45 million that we have asked for, plus some operating funding. And um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank both the, um, the premier, the provincial government, but as well also the, the federal government for their previous support in, in this. And it's also important to mention that um, even the municipal governments are now in support of this. 
Uh, you may have seen the city of Saskatoon just last week appro approved um, their commitment to this facility as well. And uh, I'd like to also mention that there is many private donors and corporate sponsors who have now come forward in support of this facility. So it's a really exciting initiative. At the end of the day, it's for Canadians and for the residents of Saskatchewan, it's for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Mo and Dr. Gertz. I'll now ask Dr. Shahab to provide an update on today's COVID-19 numbers. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Premier and Dr. Gertz. So, I'll first of all begin by again offering my condolences to uh, the family and friends of um, Saskatchewan residents who uh, lost their lives to COVID-19 since we were last here. 19 residents have passed away uh, over the last week. Um, Saskatchewan is now entering our third week of consistent slow decline in cases and hospitalizations. Uh, although we did see a bit of a concerning uptick this last weekend, but nevertheless, uh, overall, our seven-day average is going down from 16.5 uh, on February 9th, 13.6 on February 16th to 12.7 uh, today per 100,000. And our death positivity is also gradually trending down to around 7% right now. Now, similar to many other provinces, we are seeing a decline, um, but you know some provinces are also seeing a bit of a plateauing. So again, this reinforces that we really need to stay the course um, overall, uh, and especially with the variants of concern, it's really important that we keep our overall numbers trending downward. This gives us the space to have a successful vaccination program all hands on deck, um, you know, n not staff having to do contact tracing and, and clinical management of high number of cases, but really focusing on over the next weeks and months and making sure that uh, our, uh, starting with um, um, our seniors, we st uh, start, uh, you know, this very ambitious vaccination program to finally uh, come out of this pandemic through a successful vaccination program. Um, in terms of the variants of concern, like the Premier said, you know, we uh, were fully expecting to see variants uh, of concern, both travel-related and non-travel-related. Uh, we had seen three, uh, two variants of concern, uh, three actually initially linked to travel, and now we have seen a further three um, not linked to travel. Um, again, this is not um, different from what other provinces have seen, uh, uh, and what it means for us is, Basically, you know, we, we, the variants of concern, you know, for the most part respond exactly the same as um, the previous COVID-19 strains, you know, uh, keeping our physical distance, wearing masks used where appropriate, staying home and seeking testing when un uh, I'll take hand washing, all these steps reduce transmission of all COVID strains. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, minimizing tra international travel, certainly minimizing unnecessary interprovincial travel, are also important uh, steps that we can take to uh, reduce risk of importation of variants of concern to Saskatchewan and also getting testing after interprovincial travel on coming back and at day seven are all measures that will be important, plus all the other steps we're doing to continue to keep our case numbers trending downwards and allowing us the time and space to uh, successfully uh, uh, you know, continue with our vaccination program as vaccine supplies pick up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahab. We'll now take questions and we'll start on the line. Operator? We have Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi, this question is for the Premier and uh, Dr. Shahab. Uh, just on variants, uh, what are we doing and where are we at as far as uh, identifying variants sooner? And what's being considered uh, if we do see more cases or a, a spread in a certain area? to help uh, prevent uh, the variants from uh, becoming more of a concern. I'll let Dr. Shahab um, answer some of the, the what if part of the, of the question. Um, uh, with respect to identifying variants sooner, uh, the, the Roy Romano lab is going through the, the very same certification process for the variants as we did. If you think back about 10 or 11 months, uh, they went through a certification process to uh, become certified to uh, test the COVID uh, virus uh, positive cases itself. Um, that, that process does take a period of time working with the, uh, the lab in Winnipeg. And so that, that process is underway and I would uh, expect that we would be able to identify um, variants um, at the Roy Romano lab within the province of Saskatchewan sometime in early March. 
Uh, Dr. Schaub, uh, any uh, um, you know, what ifs, I suppose, uh, with respect to the variants and, and what, uh, you know, how we manage those through the public health orders that we have in place today? Thanks. So, um, at the moment, you know, up to 6% of samples uh, are screened for variants of concern by referring them to NML, and all travel-related cases, outbreaks, uh, uh, cases in uh, persons under 50 in ICU, as well as random sampling, uh, a subset of that are uh, sent for genotyping. Um, having that capacity in-house will help us increase the proportion that we can screen. Uh, it will also shorten the time it takes to get the results from, you know, one to two weeks to a few days. But nevertheless, you know, uh, all the actions we have to take all the time to prevent uh, transmission of COVID in the first place, and then if we are unwell, to seek testing, isolate at home for the 10 days for, for most people, and close contacts, quarantine for two weeks. All of that obviously must start as soon as the initial test result comes positive. We shouldn't and wait for it to be diagnosed as a variant of concern to take any further action. So, you know, doing all these things consistently, meticulously, is the most important way to keep uh, any COVID transmission uh, rate slow, including any variant of concern that may, you know, uh, uh, become established in Canada and Saskatchewan. And, of course, we are looking very closely at UK reports that suggested that the B117 variant may be more transmissible and may require more stringent public health measures. So certainly at a local level, if there was an increase in transmission, irrespective of whether it was initially identified to be a variant of concern or not, there may be a need for more specific and more stringent local public health measures. And, and similarly for other variants of concern as they emerge, you know, we'll continue to monitor what are their specific characteristics and if any public health measures need any further adjustment. By far in Canada, the vast majority of variants of concern so far have been the, uh, um, the B117 variant and, and a smaller proportion have been the um, uh, variant which is first identified in South Africa. Thank you. Adam, I would also just uh, ask Dr. Gertz uh, to weigh in a, a little bit as I think uh, the, the presence of variants is uh, indicative to the, the announcement and the importance of the announcement that we're doing here today as the, uh, the variants, um, you know, will, it was never a matter of if we were going to have variants in Canada, it was when we were going to have those variants uh, present and variants will be part of the conversation as we go through not only the next few week, days and weeks, but the next number of years. And I think uh, um, Dr. Gertz would have something to add with respect to some of the work that they're already doing um, with their vaccine and other vaccines and, and various variants that are out there and some of the work that I think will be necessary in the years ahead with respect to COVID-19 variants. Yeah, thank you. So Vito is already doing research on these variants. We already have some of them are trying to get others. So we have already UK variant working on South African and Brazilian variant. Um, we are doing research on them, so that means we're testing if our vaccine, so our own vaccine, but also other vaccines that we have tested for other Canadian companies, if they are effective against these variants. So that research is underway at the moment. I can tell you we just had a meeting last Thursday, actually, in which we adjusted our own vaccine now to the new variants to ensure that in the future our vaccine will be more effective. And many vaccine manufacturers are doing that right now, adjusting their vaccines. You may have heard of AstraZeneca and others, adjusting them to the new variants to ensure that they will be effective in the future. However, I think we all need to realize that COVID-19 is not going to go away. We will have COVID-19 around for a long time, and unfortunately also these variants around for a long time. So we need to have manufacturing capacity both here in Saskatchewan and elsewhere to ensure that in the future we have vaccines for these variants. Do you have a follow-up, Adam? Yeah, to Premier Mo, uh, you mentioned you're confident that uh, this money will come through from the yeah. federal government. Uh, what makes you say that? And what? Uh, who have you talked to? Uh, what assurances have you be received from from the federal government uh, about uh, the the confidence you have in receiving this forty-five million dollars? I'll, I'll speak a little bit to my conversations with the federal government and Dr. Gertz uh, maybe would like to speak to some of the conversations that he's had as well. But we've been working with uh, 
Dr. Gertz and Vito Interback and the federal government on uh, what is a, you know, a, a very good opportunity for investment for all levels of government and uh, individuals uh, as well as Dr. Gertz had indicated. Uh, we've had a number of letters um, of, of requests that have gone back and forth between Vito Intervac, the province, the federal government, um, letters of, of support from the province uh, to, the, uh, to the federal government, to Minister Champagne specifically, um, as this is under, uh, ultimately I believe, under uh, Minister Champagne's uh, ministerial responsibility. I as well have, have reached out, uh, mentioned Vito a number of times in our conversations with the Prime Minister, um, and spoken specifically uh, to this ask with uh, uh, Minister LeBlanc, Minister Freeland, the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, uh, up to uh, and including last night, and they're a uh, very positive response, um, and I believe the positive response is due to uh, everybody realizing the benefits uh, to all Canadians of this investment, uh, the benefits uh, not only in, in the next number of months, but the ongoing benefits of having our own domestic, not only research facility when it comes to uh, vaccine research, but the ability then to develop those vaccines and ultimately produce those vaccines to really have that, that centre of pandemic research uh, right here in Canada. And for us, we're very excited to have that located right in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and Vito Intervac. But do you want to speak a little bit to, uh, to the conversations that you've had with uh, your federal counterparts as well? Sure. So over the last uh, few months, and in fact, since September of last year, we've been talking to a number of ministers, deputy ministers and senior officials um, in the Prime Minister's office, the Clerk of the Privy Council, Finance, ISET, WD, Health, Agriculture. Uh, we spoke to Minister Karen Mandel, um, Public Health Agency, NRC. So you can see we, we really spoke to all the, the relevant ministries and the relevant people that are responsible for this. And um, I think overall have received great support in, in, in the need or understanding the need for a center that specifically can focus on emerging diseases and help the country to be better prepared for future threats. We'll take our next question on the line, operator. We have Phil Tank from the Star Phoenix. Yeah, uh, to uh, Premier Mohan and Dr. Shah, I'd like to know um, whether you feel your vaccination rollout in phase one is working as it is in terms of, you know, people are being told to wait until they're contacted, but I'm, I don't think there's a great sense of how, I know you're supposed to be going from, you know, the oldest people to the youngest in that, in the uh, 70 and above age group. But I don't think there's a sense of how that's proceeding. Can you provide a few more details about that? I would have a very high level, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Shahab, but just, just speak to, you know, the, the primary challenge we have with our vaccine um, uh, rollout, in, in, in particular in phase one, is the lack of vaccines. I mean, you know, the, the, the conversation we're having and the announcement that we, we have here today in investing in domestic vaccine uh, development and production, I, I think is... Uh, very relevant to the challenge that we've all faced as Canadians and in fairness uh, I think as global citizens have faced in, in just the lack of vaccines in the early days of, of uh, trying to find our way out of uh, this, this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I've, I've said before we have about 400,000 shots or doses that will be needed to find our way uh, totally through our phase one category which is our long-term care residents, a number of prioritized health care uh, uh, individuals as well as those uh, that are over 70 in our communities. That is um, the, correct, uh, the correct way to uh, prioritize uh, people as we know that COVID-19 does impact uh, the most elderly in our communities at a disproportionate level. In fact, I think the number was uh, recently uh, quoted as 88% of the fatalities come from people that are over or originate with people that are over 60 uh, years of age. So 400,000 doses we need for that phase one. We will only receive in the first quarter 190,000 of those doses. We've only received about 60,000 of those thus far. Fortunate due to uh, the, the great prudence of our healthcare workers, we got about 62,000 of those doses in people's arms. But we're about a third of the way, two thirds of the way through our time period of Q1, only a third of the way through our, our, our vaccines. Uh, and that is just simply due to, to uh, a lack of access. And, you know, I, I think it really bears importance on. Uh, the work that Vito Intervac is doing and the commitment the provincial government is making today, the commitment that we anticipate the federal government will be, have under active consideration in the days ahead, and I say that due to the conversations that we've had 
um, the importance of investing in our domestic research of vaccines, our domestic development of those vaccines, and ultimately the production of those vaccines to benefit uh, not only the people just in this province, but all of, the, all of Canadians abroad. Um, a very, very important uh, announcement today that I, re I think really is highlighted by the fact that we just have not had uh, enough vaccine access over the course of the last couple of months. I do view that changing in the next few months. And uh, we've been uh, building our vaccination program uh, built around prioritizing those that are most at risk and ensuring that we have the capacity to deliver the, the larger number of vaccines that we ultimately, ultimately are going to receive. Uh, Dr. Shahab, you might have a little more, uh, likely a lot more uh, to add in the way of uh, our vaccination rollout plan and, and uh, your thoughts about it. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so further to the quite extensive vaccine rollout plan that um, uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority showed, you know, multiple drive-in clinics, mass immunization clinics, and other settings in which vaccine will be delivered, I think we need to recognize that so far, even though, you know, Saskatchewan is a vast province in terms of geography, you know, healthcare providers have been very diligent in taking vaccine to the furthest corners of Saskatchewan, um, and, you know, completing first doses to 80% of long-term care residents now starting with second doses, you know, like the Premier said, being very diligent in minimizing any vaccine wastage and, in fact, getting more vaccines out of each vial than were previously um, um, prescribed per, per vial. So that process obviously will continue, but then, of course, with uh, greater vaccine supplies, there will be a very, a very different types of clinics like were demonstrated or showcase last Thursday, where you will have larger volumes of people getting vaccinated. And it may look a bit different in different parts of the province based on supply and, uh, uh, you know, uh, population. But obviously the sequencing is once the uh, vaccine, uh, larger clinics start and 80 plus in the community are completed, it will be 70 plus in the community and then 60 plus over the next few weeks and months. And obviously we have to remember if for whatever reason you miss the clinic in your community, once eligible, you're always eligible. So next time the clinic comes, you will always be eligible once you uh, are eligible based on your um, age group. So, uh, and, you know, those clinics in terms of timing will be adjusted based on vaccine supply and, and demand. Uh, and we'll have to adjust that as, as the vaccine rolls out. So, uh, you know, we have had great success in the past with uh, large immunization programs like the H1N1 program in 2009, we already give you know more than half a million doses of influenza vaccines every year. And these vaccines are a bit more um, uh, challenging in terms of logistics and handling. But so far, and that has been addressed in a very professional manner by all uh, our Saskatchewan Health Authority and other partners vaccinating. So I, I think, like the Premier said, we're well positioned, and it's just a matter of getting the vaccines and rolling the clinics out. Do you have a follow-up, Phil? Yeah. Um, so, so like what, what you said in the news release last week was that people will be con like people will be contacted during the first phase of the vaccine if they're not at long-term care homes or another or healthcare workers or in other settings. So, like if you're someone in their 90s, do you just sit there and wait for a phone call? Is that, is that how that's supposed to work? And how, and how is that prioritized throughout the province? Do you target certain uh, communities first, or is it being done all, you know, just everyone in their 90s all across the province, or, and then everyone in their 80s all across the province? How is that going to work? There will be a variety of mechanisms, and that is already happening as we speak. As vaccine comes to various uh, jurisdictions, obviously, the first priority were people in long-term care facilities, personal care homes, but already there are processes uh, that uh, will start, and some of that will not require you to be contacted. There will be announcements that in this location there is a clinic that you know could be a walk-in clinic. But obviously, uh, you know, healthcare staff do have ways of contacting individuals through age group. Um, we can certainly bring further details about how that will happen um, because there is a you know personal registry that's available with e-health. So there are ways and means of reaching out to uh, members of the community by age group or other metrics as the eligibility rolls forward. But certainly uh, all tools will be used. But I do want to emphasize that I think it's important to be aware of vaccine announcements as they will come from uh, the government or the Saskatchewan Health Authority, just as happens with the influenza campaign. 
And of course, there'll be specific reach out to priority populations as well. But we can certainly bring further details uh, as they become available, which may be different for different parts of the province. Obviously, rural remote provinces with uh, dispersed populations may have a slightly different approach than large urban centers. Thank you. Uh, Phil, I, I would just follow up. We'll have the Saskatchewan Health Authority follow up on your question as well. Uh, obviously, long-term care residents are, are we, we can contact them as we uh, go into the facilities and offer uh, the, the vaccines, even the personal care homes across the province. The healthcare staff is pretty straightforward uh, that are prioritized to be able to contact um, those uh, through the SHA. Uh, when we get into the individuals that are 70 plus years old, 60 to 69 ultimately in phase two, uh, but into those age-based categories, uh, we'll have the Saskatchewan Health Authority uh, provide you with uh, the precise details on uh, how and if those folks are being contacted. We'll take our next question in the room, Steph. Yeah. Uh, when we're seeing variants of concern spreading in this province and all the evidence points to how explosive their growth can be, why are we not doing more right now to prevent that from happening versus just using the existing public health orders and rules in place? Well, I, I would say that existing public health orders are effective uh, with variants as they are effective with the original COVID-19 um, uh, virus that we have. Uh, as uh, Dr. Shahab had said, it was, it was never if we were going to have variants arrive in Saskatchewan, it was when. Um, and we have had those arrive now with seven, uh, seven cases with uh, compiling of two different uh, variants. Um, but in other areas around the world where you see these variants arrive, you, you do see the public health measures that are in place. Uh, being looked at very closely, but uh, it's just exactly the same public health measures that prevent the spread of variants that um, will that that prevent the spread of, of the original COVID. We we took measures last week with respect to those that may have traveled interprovincially to ask them to test, uh, receive a test on their return, as well as an additional test uh, seven days after um, their re their return. Um, and I had spoken earlier today about the Roy Romano lab. Um, working through the certification process to ensure that we're able to test uh, those variants uh, here, right here in Saskatchewan, and that would uh, would enable two things: a little quicker turnaround, I believe, of the testing uh, time, but also allow us to test uh, a larger number of, of samples uh, here in Saskatchewan. So they're working through that, and uh, and plan to be certified by uh, sometime in early March, um, which will uh, enable us uh, to uh, you know identify and uh, and test a larger degree of samples. Um, right here in Saskatchewan, but that, that's a process that, that, as I said, mirrors the process of how the Roy Romano lab uh, became certified to ultimately test for COVID-19 uh, back in the early days of this pandemic. Uh, Dr. Shahab, uh, anything uh, to add maybe on, on the percentage of uh, variants that, uh, or per percentage of tests that are being sent away for variants and, you know, where that may go in the days ahead? Yeah, thanks. So what I'd like to add is that obviously, uh, sampling, you know, 6% of uh, tests is currently happening with in-house testing, that proportion will increase. Uh, obviously, you can sample more, a higher proportion if you have lower number of case numbers. So that's the importance of keeping our case numbers low. And in terms of public health measures, we're obviously, all of us in Canada are reviewing our public health measures to see what adjustments do we need to make for variants of concern. We've obviously seen in the UK how over a period of two to three months, the variants of concern may, became the predominant strain in the UK, especially initially in the southeast of England and London, even though they were, uh, they were in a lockdown. Um, but obviously, we need to look at how transmission dynamics will be impacted in our own province. And we have to remember that everything that is so important in preventing COVID transmission remains as important or more important with variants of concern. So outdoors is better than indoors. Physical distance, two meters or more, uh, mask use, all these things impact variants of concern the same way as they impact, uh, you know, uh, current strains. But it becomes even the more important to pay attention to those. So settings which are crowded, which are indoors, uh, uh, increase transmission. So, you know, the fundamentals remain important. But obviously, um, you know, uh, like I said earlier, we are a huge province with, you know, some large urban centers, many smaller communities and dispersed populations. So at whatever our context is, reducing transmission um, between households uh, in workplaces when we're out and about will remain essential over the next weeks and months. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Premier, the budget your government plans to release falls on the three-year anniversary of the Humboldt Broncos collision. Do you have any intention to change that? Uh, no, I, I understand that the you know the the, the critic has uh, put out a news release uh, with respect to changing the budget day, and you know the, the critic could have just as easily reached out to the MLA uh, for Humboldt, who happens to be the Minister of Finance, who also happens to be uh, the Deputy Premier. And if we think back to three years ago when the the Humboldt bus tragedy occurred, um, it affected everyone in this province, beyond this province, and I would say in many cases affected people all around the world. Um, in this building and with my colleagues, it affected no one more than the Minister of Finance, the MLA for Humboldt, Donna Harpower. Um, at that particular time, our budget was set to take place about four days after that event. I had offered to the Minister of the Day, also the MLA for Humboldt, represents many of these families that were impacted by uh, that, that tragedy, should we move the budget. And she wouldn't hear of it on that day. She has honoured uh, those families and those individuals and that that entire, all of those involved with that tragedy each and every day since then. And I know for certain that our Minister of Finance, when she delivers the budget this spring, will also uh, be honouring uh, those families, all of those impacted. She'll have her sticks outside her door. We'll have them outside of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, we most certainly, um, uh, I, would, I would like to acknowledge um, the, the way that our Minister of Finance has, uh, you know, honoured all of those involved in that tragedy uh, every day since it's occurred. We'll take our next question on the line, operator. We have Lisa Schick with CJME. Hi. Um, we've been hearing from people in several places in the province that this past weekend, vaccine distribution kind of went sideways, that people were being called and offered doses, but then others heard about it and they just kind of showed up at the facility where doses were being given out, that it was kind of a bit of a free-for-all. So. Can, can you explain what happened in these communities, why that happened, and what the plan was actually supposed to be? I, I, I'm not sure of the specific incident that you are uh, alluding to. Um, many, if not all, of the, the vaccination uh, uh, events around the province that have taken place have gone quite smoothly. To, to my knowledge, if there's a, one area or one, uh, one incident that did not, um, I'll ask the SHA to follow up with you on that particular uh, event, uh, Lisa, unless you have something uh, to add to that, uh, Dr. Shaw, but again, I think this speaks to, you know, the challenge that we're all facing in Saskatchewan, Canada and around the world, and it's ultimately a, a, a lack of vaccines, and we're, we're, you know, in particularly challenged uh, here in Canada, which again, I would just re-emphasize, um, as, as we look ahead into the future, uh, speaks to the importance of the, uh, the announcement that we have here today, um, the work that Vito Intervac is doing to provide that, that research that, uh, um, that, and ultimately that production of, of domestic, domestic vaccines uh, for all Canadians. And most certainly is, uh, you know, something that I, I think we all could have moved on in years gone by as the request was there of the provincial government, the federal government. We had requested of the federal government as well, uh, but most certainly uh, highlights the importance of moving forward with this investment uh, today on behalf of all the people of this province and, and the people across Canada. But unless you have something to add, Dr. Shahab, I'll, uh, I would ask the SHA to follow up if there was a specific occurrence uh, that uh, didn't go as, as smoothly as, as I think the vast majority uh, of the uh, vaccination centres have. Yeah, no, nothing further to add on this specific uh, instance, Premier. Follow-up, Lisa? Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we've we um, tried to get comments from the SHA, but haven't had any luck so far on that. Um, now, we have heard it's been multiple places. It wasn't just one instance, and we'd heard from people that, you know, that was kind of happening at vaccine clinics. We're hearing from people that there was a vaccine clinic in their community, they were of the age to get it, but they had no idea about it. They hadn't heard anything about it. So if there are these kind of problems, one person described it to me as, you know, it seems like the government is just flying by the seat of their pants on this. So if this kind of thing is happening right now, what kind of confidence can the public have in the government's vaccine plan or in this, how the second phase is going to go? Well, if, if, if there's uh, priority calls that are going out and someone else hasn't heard uh, about it, I, um, I don't know where they would rank in, in the priority level. But I would, I would say that Saskatchewan people can have every confidence in the vaccination plan that we have, uh, have put forward. Our, our phase one priority uh, does prioritize those uh, health care workers 
um, uh, those long-term care residents and ultimately uh, those over 70 in our communities who are at the highest risk of severe outcomes when it comes to uh, being infected with COVID-19. And when we receive our, our first, uh, you know, three, 400,000 doses and are able to make our way through the bulk of phase one, we're quickly going to move to phase two to that age-based criteria to ensure that we're addressing uh, the next highest risk uh, to uh, severe outcomes from COVID-19. So um, and we, we have based, we've said all along that we have based our vaccination plan on addressing uh, those with highest risk, but also ensuring that we can preserve the capacity to uh, provide as many vaccines to Saskatchewan residents as possible in as short a shorter time period. Um, Saskatchewan people can have every confidence that as we receive the vaccines, we're going to make them available to as many people as possible. What we need right now is we need more vaccines, we need them more quickly, and we need to keep an eye to the future to ensure that we never run into this vaccine shortage again by investing in institutions or organizations such as Vito Intervac, preserve our domestic supply, our domestic research, and ultimately our, our opportunity to have access to a, a better conversation the next time uh, we find ourselves in this situation. We'll take our next question in the room, Mark. Um, why is the province's funding to veto Intervac contingent on federal government also providing funding and would the province consider providing more funding if the feds don't come up with their share? I, through the conversations that we've had, I, you know, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic that the federal government will, uh, you know, look very favorably on the investment uh, um, that has been put forward by Dr. Gertz and his team at Vito Intervac um, for a host of reasons. They've made similar investments in other areas of Canada to, and this isn't an either or investment. This is an all above uh, the line on ensuring that we have multiple access to vaccines uh, here in Canada. Um, the, 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 a number of uh, ministers and the federal government proper is very familiar with with the, the good work that Vito Intervac has done um, over the last number of years and continues uh, to do today. And uh, they came forward with their investment uh, along with the provincial government on the production facility at Vito Intervac. You might have a few words to say about that, Dr. Gertz, uh, uh, in a minute, uh, last spring. Um, and that was work done by Christian Freeland and yes, uh, Dominic LeBlanc, of who I have spoken to uh, in the last 24 hours and we're both uh, you know, very optimistic and positive and thankful that the province is uh, stepping forward uh, with our commitment and the federal government will ultimately uh, consider their their commitment in due course. This is a this is a good investment um, on behalf of uh, not just the people of Saskatchewan, but the people of Canada, an investment not just uh, for the next three to six months, but an investment for the next uh, number of decades uh, to ensure that we don't find ourselves in, in this type of a situation in, in the years ahead. Uh, Dr. Gertz, anything on uh, your correspondence or your production facility and, and the opportunities that you see? So just to highlight, for years now, both the province of Saskatchewan as well as the federal government have been supporting Vito. Um, both through investments into the infrastructure, but also through operating support. Um, so just last year, we received uh, support both from the province as well as the federal government for the manufacturing facility that is currently being constructed. It's a $20 million project overall. Last year, we received um, support from the province of Saskatchewan as well as the federal government for the second part to really now make also human vaccines. The manufacturing facility is under construction. Um, com construction will be complete by October of this year. If you drive by the facility now, you will actually see that it's a shell essentially and we're putting in the rooms right now and the equipment is all being ordered. Some of this equipment, as you can imagine, many countries around the world are looking now at their manufacturing capacity and they're ordering all this equipment. Some of that equipment has lead times of 48 weeks. All of that has been ordered, it's on schedule. Construction will be completed in October of this year. It will then go through a process of commissioning the facility, which we hope will be last about um, less than half a year, and then we can start um, our production runs. I think one note on that, um, Dr. Gertz, is, is uh, the, the production facility isn't solely exclusively for the, vac the Vito Intervac vaccine right. either. So. This is really, so it's not only for COVID-19 vaccine, it's not only for our vaccine, the whole concept of this facility was, was a manufacturing facility that is available to anyone who needed to have pilot scale clinical trial or clinical grade material to go into clinical trials. And during situations like this, a, a global pandemic emergencies, then this facility can also um, manufacture vaccines for all Canadians. And so there is not only focus on COVID-19, but it will be able in the future to to address any other vaccine. And in the context of COVID-19, this facility is one of the 
most um, versatile or unique facilities in, in, in the world, actually, when it's up and running. Not only can we make human and animal vaccines there, but we can also make different vaccine technologies in the same facility. So of all the vaccines that are currently in development, we can make all of, all of the vaccines, with the exception, unfortunately, of the RNA vaccine that requires a completely um, different manufacturing process. It's almost like a chemical factory um, that you need to make RNA vaccines. But all other vaccines, including Novavax, AstraZeneca, and so on, can be made at Vito in our facility. Follow up? Yes, um, when it comes to the two variants that were detected here in Regina that have no link to travel, um, the city's seen an uptick in test positivity rate over the last two weeks. Um, is there any concern that this variant is spreading already in the community and, and what can be done if, if that is the case? Well, uh, Dr. Shahab, I would, I would turn this over to you, but I, I think there's always been a concern that the variants are going to be present in our communities. And, and as uh, Dr. Shahab, it wasn't a, um, a thinking that they wouldn't become present in our communities. It was a matter of when and, and do we have the appropriate public health measures in place to limit the spread uh, uh, to the degree that we can until such time that we have uh, access, mass access to uh, the vaccines in, in our communities. So, uh, you know, I, I think this is, uh, you know, a topic now with uh, a number of variants uh, available today. Some, as you mentioned, without, um, you know, history or links to travel. Uh, that doctor is top of mind uh, for, for Dr. Shahab. And I, I, you know, we have spoken here, here many times about potentially, um, you know, making some changes around the household gathering size, for instance. I'm certain that the presence of these variants is part of what's going into Dr. Shahab's recommendations around that, for instance. So, uh, Dr. Shahab, you have any, uh, any details on your thoughts on the uh, uh, now increased level of, of variants uh, in, in uh, Regina specifically, but in the province as well? Yeah, thanks. So our current, uh, you know, lower case numbers allow for complete public health investigations, including, uh, you know, uh, uh, extensive contact tracing. So that happens with every case of COVID identified. And there was a time when our case numbers were high when contact tracing capacity was severely strained. But right now, that's happening. And whenever we're into concern is identified public health, all it goes back to review the situation if there's any further investigations or testing that's required. So that will continue to happen. And especially if at this point, there's no indication that a way into concern was identified as a result of an outbreak investigation. But if it was, then there may be some further, um, more extensive testing that may be required. And so obviously, um, you know, like the Premier said, we expect to see uh, variants of concern uh, with increasing frequency. And if there's any specific concerns, just like we communicate concerns around outbreaks, if there's an outbreak due to variant concern, it, and if that requires any further measures beyond the routine measures, we'll be communicating that as well. Thank you. Really, there's, there's two well, a number of things that Dr. Shahab and others are keeping their eye on, but today we're paying attention to the case numbers, obviously, the variants now that are present, as well as, uh, you know, our, our daily vaccine delivery and our, and our vaccine access that we're going to have in, in the days ahead and how we make that as available as quickly as possible to um, those prioritized age groups in Saskatchewan. But at the same time, we're trying to look forward to uh, tomorrow and how we get our place, our province and our nation, and do our part to ensure that we're not faced with these types of, of challenges again. That when we are faced with the next pandemic, and we will, we've had a, a few, uh, um, you know, over the over the course of the last few decades. So there, there's nothing, uh, you know, precluding that we won't be faced with another situation similar to this at some point in the future. That we have that domestic capacity, right, from research development right up to the uh, production of vaccines, not only right here in Canada, but part of it. Part of the Canadian capacity right here in Saskatoon is Vito Intervac. So very much concerned about today with the measures that we have in place and are they, um, you know, sufficient enough to deal with the variants that we have, um, watching our vaccination plan unroll, but also planning for, uh, you know, the future so that we can be in a, a stronger position should we be faced with these very same, uh, in, it's very same uh, uh, the very same questions uh, in years to come. We'll take our next question on the line, operator. We have Lara Faminoff with 650 CKOM. Oh, can't hear you, Lara. We'll take another question on the line, operator. We have Nathaniel Dove with Global. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? We got you, Nathaniel. 
Okay. Uh, so my question is for uh, you, Premier, and Dr. Gertz. Uh, I'm curious, um, given that the federal government has contributed money to VITO, but to other labs as well, uh, why are you confident uh, VITO will get this funding? And when do you expect to hear from the federal government on this? I would say uh, it'll be the federal government's timeline on, uh, you know, when they would ultimately make a decision around uh, the funding. I would say that the request is on uh, on Minister Champagne's desk. Um, those conversations between Minister Champagne and our minister have taken place and uh, continue to take place up to and including today. Um, and I, uh, as well, have spoken, as I said, uh, with respect to the good work that Vito Intervac does with the Prime Minister and specifically uh, to this particular project and other projects uh, that Vito has uh, uh, embarked on, but this particular project with uh, Minister LeBlanc, Minister uh, Freeland, and and, uh, and and this is really an opportunity, an opportunity for all of us to come together to invest in, uh, you know, the future health and ultimately the wealth of, of, of Saskatchewan people and all Canadians. And Vito, Vito's uh, investment in their uh, Centre for Pandemic Research is so very important for Canada as it, as it takes us all the way through the steps from research to development to ultimately production of the, the vaccine, but it's also part of the broader Canadian solution where there are, uh, you know, going to be a number of, of areas that where we will ultimately have the ability to produce vaccines uh, here in Canada. Um, I, I don't know, there may be one other area that, that can have the breadth of, uh, of, uh, of initiatives that Vito Intervac uh, can have, but most certainly, most certainly uh, at this point in time when we are at the stage of the global COVID-19 pandemic that we are in Canada, when presented with a, an opportunity where a provincial government, uh, a reputable institute that you've invested in uh, before, such as Vito Inovac, the opportunity to, to invest in a center of, 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 uh, of pandemic research um, is, is, is really a, a positive opportunity for all. Um, I've received nothing but positive responses from the federal government with, with our commitment um, leading up to and including uh, the announcement today. And so I'm, you know, I'm very optimistic that the federal government uh, will be having you know, very uh, encouraging conversations about this in the lead up to ultimately when they will make a decision. But Dr. Gertz? Yeah, maybe to add to that, I think it's also important to highlight again that we already um, have significant infrastructure in place. So we're not asking to build something new here. We, we really um, building on previous investments. We already operate Canada's largest high containment facility, which allows us to work with these pathogens. And as we discussed, we already constructing a GMP vaccine manufacturing facility. So there is, in my mind or in our mind, there's three elements that you need to be able to rapidly respond to an emerging disease. And that is to have a high containment facility so you can work with these pathogens, in-house manufacturing so you can quickly manufacture your clinical grade material. And lastly, you have to have the ability to work with a wide range of animals from which these diseases jump into humans. And those three elements need to come together. And then you have the center that can quickly respond to any new emerging disease, whether it's affecting humans or animals. Follow up, Nathaniel. Yes, uh, so given how important and how crucial this facility will be in the future, if indeed it, it, uh, the funding does come to Saskatchewan, where would our vaccination research and rollout be if we'd had this pandemic research center before the current uh, COVID-19 crisis. Maybe you want to speak to that. Dr. So if we had our manufacturing facility up and running, you might have heard me on the on uh, an interview saying this before, we would have been in clinical trials six months earlier. Um, we, we were one, as I mentioned earlier, we were one of the fastest in the world to respond to this. We had a vaccine ready within five weeks. We were one of the first in the world, and I can say that with confidence because we're attending these weekly expert group meetings organized by the World Health Organization. And so every week, researchers around the world are updating each other on, on their results in, in real life time. And so we knew exactly that in the beginning, our animal trials was one of the first in the world to test a vaccine. What has taken us then longer than some of these larger companies is that for the manufacturing, we had to go outside and contract others to manufacture the clinical grade material for us. And so in the future, with having in-house, vertically integrated manufacturing capacity, we can, we can now do this in-house. We don't need to go outside. We, we don't waste time when we, when we produce the vaccine. I, I would uh, you just say in, 
<laughs> looking over the course of the last what will be 12 months very shortly, um, six months uh, to expedite vaccine research by six months yeah, means an awful lot. It would mean an awful lot to the people of Saskatchewan, the people of Canada and the people around the world to have access to those vaccines six months earlier. So uh, credit to Dr. Gertz and his team for the work and effort uh, that they are making. I thank them on behalf of the province uh, for that. I thank in advance uh, the federal government for their consideration of this very valuable proposal that you've put uh, before them. And, and I thank you for providing the province the opportunity to participate. This is a, a very positive step forward in uh, not only COVID research uh, vaccine production, but pandemic research and vaccine production. And we look forward to uh, working with yourself and the federal government to make it real. Thank you. We'll try CKOM again. Laura, are you on the line? Laura. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us.